The Ichabog by J.K. Rowling, Part 5. Chapter 14. Lord Spickleworth's Plans. When the fog cleared at last, it revealed a very different party of men to those who'd arrived at the edge of the marsh an hour earlier. Quite apart from their shock at the sudden death of Major Beamish, a few of the Royal Guard were confused by the explanation they'd been given. Here were the two lords, the King, and the hastily promoted Major Roach, all swearing they'd come face to face with a monster that all but the most foolish had dismissed for years as a fairy tale. Could it really be true that beneath the tightly wrapped cloaks, Beamish's body bore the tooth and claw marks of the Ichabog? Are you calling me a liar? Major Roach growled into the face of a young private. Are you calling the king a liar? barked Flapoon. The private didn't dare question the word of the king, so he shook his head. Captain Goodfellow, who'd been a particularly good friend of Major Beamish's, said nothing. However, there was such an angry and suspicious look on Goodfellow's face that Roach ordered him to go and pitch the tents on the most solid bit of ground he could find and be quick about it because the dangerous fog might yet return. In, sp In spite of the fact he had a straw mattress and that blankets were taken from the soldiers to ensure his comfort, King Fred had never spent a more unpleasant night. He was tired, dirty, wet and above all, frightened. What if the Ichabod comes looking for us, Spittleworth, said the king. What if, it, what if it tracks our scent? It's already had a taste of poor Beamish. What if it comes looking for the rest of the body? Spittleworth attempted to soothe the king. Do not fear, your majesty. Roach has ordered Captain Goodfellow to keep watch outside your tent. Whoever else gets eaten, you will be the last. It was too dark for the king to see Spittleworth grinning. Far from wanting to reassure the king, Spittleworth hoped to fan the king's fears. His entire plan rested on a king who not only believed in a Nicobog, but who was scared it might leave the marsh to chase him. The following morning, the king's party set off back to Jeroboam. Spittleworth sent a message ahead to tell the mayor of Jeroboam that there had been a nasty accident at the marsh, so the king didn't want any trumpets or corks greeting him. Thus, when the king's party arrived, the city was silent. Townsfolk pressing their faces to the windows or peeking round their doors were shocked to see the king so dirty and miserable, but not nearly as shocked as they were to see a body wrapped in cloaks tied to Major Beamish's steel grey horse. When they reached the inn, Spittleworth took the landlord aside. We require some cold, secure place, perhaps a cellar where we can store a body for the night, and I shall need to keep the key myself. What happened, my lord? asked the innkeeper as Roach carried Beamish down the stone steps into the cellar. I shall tell you the truth, my good man, seeing as you have looked after us so well. But it must go no further, said Spittleworth in a low, serious voice. The Ichabog is real and has savagely killed one of our men. You understand, I'm sure, why this must not be widely broadcast. There would be instant panic. The king is returning with all speed to the palace, where he and his advisers, myself of course included, will begin working at once on a set of measures to secure our country's safety. The Ichabog? Real? said the landlord in astonishment and fear. Real and vengeful and vicious, said Spittleworth. But as I say, this must go no further. Widespread alarm will benefit nobody. In fact, widespread alarm was precisely what Spittleworth wanted because it was essential for the next phase of his plan. Just as he'd expected, the landlord waited only until his guests had gone to bed and then rushed to tell his wife, who ran to tell the neighbours and by the time the King's party set off for Coatsburg the following morning, they left behind them a city where panic was fermenting as busily as the wine. Spittleworth sent a message ahead to Coatsburg, warning the cheese-making city not to make a fuss of the King either, so it was too dark and silent when the royal party entered its streets. The faces at the windows were already scared. It so happened that a merchant from Jeroboam, with an especially fast horse, had carried the rumour about the Ichabod to Kurdsburg an hour previously. Once again, 
Spittleworth requested the use of a cellar for Major Beamish's body and once again confided to the landlord that the Ichabog had killed one of the king's men. Having seen Beamish's body safely up, locked up, Spittleworth went upstairs to bed. He was just rubbing ointment into the blisters on his bottom when he received an urgent summons to go to see the king. Smirking, Spittleworth pulled on his pantaloons, winked at Flapoon, who was enjoying a cheese and pickle sandwich, picked up his candle and proceeded along the corridor to King Fred's room. The king was huddled in bed wearing his silk nightcap and as soon as Spittleworth closed the bedroom door, Fred said, Spittleworth, I keep hearing whispers about the Ichabog. The stable boys were talking and even the maid who just passed my, by my bedroom door. Why is this? How can they know what happened? Alas, your majesty, sighed Spittleworth. I'd hoped to conceal the truth from you until we were safely back at the palace. But I should have known that your majesty is too shrewd to be fooled. Since we left the Marsar, the Ichabog has as your majesty feared, become much more aggressive. Oh no, whispered the king. I'm afraid so, sire. But after all, attacking it was bound to make it more dangerous. But who attacked it, said Fred. Why you did, your majesty, said Spittleworth. Roach tells me your sword was embedded in the monster's neck when it rang. I'm sorry, your majesty. Did you speak? The king had in fact let out a sort of hum but after a second or two he shook his head he considered correcting spittleworth he was sure he told the story differently but his horrible experience in the fog sounded much better the way spittleworth told it now that he'd stood his ground and fought the ichabog rather than simply dropping his sword and running away but this is awful spittleworth whispered the king what would become of us if the monsters become more ferocious Never fear, your majesty, said Spittleworth, approaching the king's bedroom, the candlelight illuminating his long nose and his cruel smile from below. I intend to make it my life's worth to protect you and the kingdom from the Ichabod. Uh, uh, thank you, Spittleworth. You are a true friend, said the king, deeply moved, and he fumbled to extract the hands from his eiderdown and clasped that of the cunning lord. Chapter 15 the king returns. By the time the king set out for Shoeville the following morning, rumours of that the Ichabog had killed a man had not only travelled over the bridge into Baronstown, they'd even trickled down to the capital, courtesy of a cluster of cheesemongers who'd set out before dawn. However, Shoeville was not only the furthest away from the northern marsh, it also held itself to be far better informed and educated than the other cornucopian towns. So when the wave of panic reached the capital, it met an up, upswell of disbelief. The city's taverns and markets rang with excited arguments. Skeptics laughed at the preposterous idea of the Ichabog existing, while others said that people who'd never been to the marshlands ought not to pretend to be experts. The Ichabog rumours had gained a lot of colour as they travelled south. Some people said that the Ichabog had killed three men, others that it had merely torn off someone's nose. In the city within the city, however, discussion was seasoned with a little pinch of anxiety. The wives, children and friends of the Royal Guard were worried about the soldiers, but they assured each other that if any of the men had been killed, their families would have been informed by the messenger. This was the comfort that Mr. Mrs Beamish gave Bert when he came looking for her in the palace kitchens, having been scared by the rumours circulating among the school children. The king would have told us if anything had happened to daddy, she told Bert. Here now, I've got you a little treat. Mrs Beamish had prepared hopes of heavens for the king's return, and she gave one now that was, wasn't quite symmetrical to Bert. He gasped because he'd only ever eaten hopes of heaven on his birthday and bit into the little cake. At once, his eyes filled with happy tears as paradise wafted up through the roof of his mouth and melted all his cares away. He thought excitedly of his father coming home in his smart uniform and how he, Bert, would be centre of attention at school tomorrow because he'd know exactly what happened to the king's men's in the faraway marshlands. Dusk was settling over Shoeville when at last the king's party rode into view. 
This time, Spittleworth had sent a message to tell people to stay inside. He wanted the king to feel the full force of Shuville's panic and fear when they saw his majesty returning to the, pal to the palace with one body of the royal guard. The people of Shuville saw the drawn, miserable faces of the returning men and watched in silence as the party approached. Then they spotted the body, wrapped up, slung over the steel grey horse, and gasps spread through the crowd like flames. Up through the narrowed cobble streets of Shuville, the king's party moved, and men removed their hats and women curtsied, and they hardly knew whether they were paying respects to the king or the dead man. Daisy Dovetail was one of the first to realise who was missing. Peering between the legs of the grown-ups, she recognised Major Beamish's horse. Instantly forgetting that she and Bert hadn't talked to each other since their fight of the previous week, Daisy pulled free of her father's hands and began to run, forcing her way through the crowds, her brown pigtails flying. She had to reach Bert before he saw the body on the horse. She had to warn him, but the people were so tightly packed that fa as fast as Daisy moved, she couldn't keep pace with the horses. Bert and Mrs Beamish, who were standing outside their cottage in the shadow of the palace walls, knew there was something wrong because of all the crowd's gasps. Although Mrs Beamish felt somewhat anxious, she was still sure that she was about to see her handsome husband because the king would have sent word if he'd been hurt. So when the procession rounded the corner, Mrs Beamish's eyelids slid from face to face, expecting to see the majors. And when she realised that there were no more faces left, the colour drained slowly from her own. Then her gaze fell upon the body strapped to Major Beamish's steel grey horse, and, still holding Bert's hands, she fainted clean away. Chapter 16 Bert Says Goodbye Spittlemurth noticed a commotion beside the palace walls and strained to see what was going on. When he spotted the woman on, a, on the ground and heard the cries of shock and pity, he suddenly realised that he'd left a loose end that might yet trip him up. A widow. As he rode past the little knot of people in the crowd who were fanning Mrs Beamish's face, Spittleworth knew that his longed-for bath must be postponed and his crafty brain began to race again. Once the king's parties were safely in the courtyard and servants had hurried to assist Fred from his horse, Spittleworth pulled Major Roach aside. The widow, Beamish's widow, he must have muttered. Why didn't you send her word about his death? It never occurred to me, my lord, said Tr Roach truthfully. He'd been too busy thinking about the jewelled sword all the way home, how best to sell it and whether it would be better to break it up into pieces so that nobody would recognise it. Curse you, Roach! Must I think of everything? snarled Spittleworth. Go now, take Beamish's body out of those filthy cloaks, cover it with a cornucopian flag and lay him out in the blue parlour. Put guards on the door and then bring Mrs Beamish to me in the throne room. Also, give the order that these soldiers must not go home or talk to their families until I've spoken to them. It's essential that we all tell the same story. Now hurry, fool, hurry. Beamish's widow could ruin everything. Spittleworth pushed past his pushed his way past the soldiers and stable boys to where Flippoon was being lifted off his horse. Keep the king away from the throne room in the blue parlour, Spittleworth whispered in Flippoon's ears. Encourage him to go to bed. Flippoon nodded and Spittleworth hurried away through the dimly lit palace corridors, casting off dusty riding coat as he went and bellowing at the servants to fetch him, fetch him fresh clothes. Once in the deserted flame the rain room, Spittleworth pulled on his clean jacket and ordered a maid to light a single lamp and bring him a glass of wine. Then he waited. At last there came a knock on the door. Enter! shouted Spittleworth, and in came Major Roach, accompanied by a white-faced Mrs Beamish and young Bert. My dear Mrs Beamish, my very dear Mrs Beamish, said Spittleworth, striding towards her and clasping her free hand. The king has asked me to tell you how deeply sorry he is. I add my own condolences. What a tragedy! What an awful tragedy! Why did no one send word? sobbed Mrs Beamish. Why, why did we have to find out by seeing his poor, his poor body? She swayed a little and Roach hurried to fetch a small golden chair. The maid, who was called Hetty, arrived with wines for Spittleworth and while she was pouring it, Spittleworth stared. Dear lady, we did in fact send word. We sent a messenger. 
didn't we, Roach? That's right, said Roach. We sent a young lad called... But here Roach got stuck. He was a man of very little imagination. Nobby, said Spiffleworth, saying the first name that came into his head. Little Nobby Buttons, he added, because the flickering lamplight had just illuminated one of Roach's golden buttons. Yes, little Nobby Buttons volunteered and off he galloped. We could have come... We could... What could have become of him? Roach, said Spiffleworth. We must send out a search party at once to see whether any trace of Nobby Buttons can be found. At once, my lord, said Roach, bowing deeply, and he left. H How did my husband die? whispered Mrs Beamish. Well, madam, said Spittleworth, speaking carefully, for he knew that the story he now told would become the official version and that he'd have to stick by it for ever. As you may have heard, we journeyed to the marshlands because we received word that the Ichabog had carried off a dog. Shortly after our arrival, I regret to say that our entire party was attacked by the monster. It lunged for the king first, but he fought most bravely, sinking his sword into the monster's neck. To the tough-skinned Ichabog, however, twas but a beasting. Enraged, it sought for the victims, and though Mr Beamish put the most up the most heroic struggle, I regret to say that he laid down his life for the king. Then Lord Flapoon had the excellent notion of firing his blunderbuss, which scared the Ichabog away. We brought poor Beamish out of the marsh, asked for a volunteer to take news of his death to his family. Dear little Nobby Buttons said he'd do it, and he leapt up onto his horse, and until we reached Shoeville, I never doubted that he'd arrived and given you warning of this dreadful tragedy. Can I? Can I see my husband? wept Mrs Beamish. Of course, of course, said Spittleworth. He's in the blue parlour. He led Mrs Beamish and Bert, who was clutching his mother's hand, to the doors of the parlour where he paused. I regret, he said that we cannot remove the flag covering him. His injuries would be far too distressing for you to see. A fang in claw marks, you know. Mrs Beamish swayed again and Bert grabbed hold of her to keep her upright. Now Lord Flapoon walked up to the group holding a tray of pies. King's in bed, he said thickly to Spittleworth. Oh, hello, he added, looking at Mrs Beamish, who was one of the few servants whose name he knew because she baked the pastries. Sorry about the Major, said Flapoon, spraying Mrs Beamish and Bert with crumbs of pie crust. Always liked him. He walked away, leaving Spittleworth to open the door of the blue parlour to let Mrs Beamish and Bert inside. There lay the body of Major, Major Beamish, concealed beneath the cornucopian flag. Can't I at least kiss him one last time, sobbed Mrs Beamish. Quite impossible, I'm afraid, said Spittleworth. His face is half gone. His hand, mother, said Bert, speaking for the first time. I'm sure his hand will be all right. And before Spittleworth could stop the boy, Bert reached underneath the flag for his father's hand, which was quite unmarked. Mrs Beamish knelt down and kissed the hand over and over again, until it shone with tears as they made of porcelain. Then Bert helped her to her feet, and the two of them left the blue parlour without another word.